geotechnical engineering, transportation engineering, and environmental engineering. So besides we are offering the B.Tech in the civil engineering, we also offer the special lessons in this M.Tech degree in the transportation, geotechnical engineering, structural engineering, environmental engineering, and water resource engineering, and the Ph.D. degrees as being offered regularly besides that PhD degree, regular PhD degree, there is a provision of the executive PhD program also. About 100 students of the MTech students, they get admitted uh, into our in department every day in the, in the uh, per year to this department. And out of this MTech and the uh, PhD programs, the very quality, quality and the good number of publications are being uh, published and our objective is to provide the good teaching as well as good uh, uh, research and very strong relations with the industry. With this, our the um, faculties, they interact with the outsides through these many short-term courses and the training programs, workshops, conferences, seminars, likewise. And during this pandemic situation, it is not possible that the, the persons from the industries or persons from the educational institutions or from the research laboratories or other organizations, they come to these, our institutes and the outside faculties also to deliver their talk. So that's why the online mode of this webinar is preferred and the is being um, continued. And in this uh, uh, month, Two programs, such programs in the department have been conducted very uh, to tying with the industries and tying with the other research laboratories and tying with the other educational institutions. So, uh, besides the agent in the TQIP3, this program is sponsored by the TQIP3, and besides as a TQIP3 coordinator, I am the we have the given the liberty to give the sponsoring to many of the departments. Like say other departments also they have conducted such type of programs in the various departments. Again also there are the other programs are on the pipeline and the short term courses. All these are now in the online modes. So for this program I wish a, a big success and, and uh, thank you all. Thank you, sir, for your generous words. Now, I would like, I would again like to uh, invite Professor Chitranjan Patra as coordinator of Equip 3 to give the so, talk. I have completed as the coordinator as I have given. Okay, sir. Okay. Now, I would like to invite um, the chief guest, Professor Animes Vishwas, director of NIT Rautla, to give his talk. Good morning to everybody, uh, respected dignitaries, uh, my colleagues, Professor Sia Patro, uh, the TQP uh, coordinator, as well as head of the uh, civil engineering departments, then Subhajit, Professor Subhajit Mondals, other my uh, distinguished colleagues and participants. It's the great pleasure to uh, hear that uh, this thing, civil engineering department took uh, consecutive uh, webinar meeting that, uh, uh, conducting. <coughs> Uh, yesterday there was a meeting and uh, again uh, today I, I am very happy in a different field and that it reflects the civil engineering department is very proactive and uh, the, they definitely want the exchange of ideas and exchange of knowledge and dissemination of knowledge both inside it, uh, these things they want eagerly to take to take place as that they can contribute significantly for the growth of the uh, growth of the department and growth of the uh, institute. So I wish all the best for the success for the for this workshop and definitely it will uh, yeah, it will be a path breaking for the or many many uh, 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 many people who are participant in this workshop thank you very much thank you sir for your kind words i would like to call uh, dr subhajit mondal sir to deliver the vote of thanks it's my uh, privilege to propose a vote of thanks and acknowledge the contribution 
of those who work, work really hard to make this faculty development program program to success. On behalf of the civil engineering department, I extend a really hearty vote of thanks to our chief guest, Professor Animas Bissas, director of Nantir Arkala, who spared his time from his busy schedule to grace this occasion. Today, we had an opportunity to hear the thought of his uh, thought and will surely be going to encourage us to do our future event. A special thanks to our respected HOT, the Department of Civil Engineering, and the coordinator of TQIP3, Professor Chitranjan Patra, for being a catalyst and stimulate us to do this such type of activity. We are learning many things from our HOT on our day to day basis. He provided his valuable suggestion to make it a very, very success. I hope we all will be able to organize such program in our center with the help of HOT. I wish I also wish to express my gratitude to all the faculty colleagues, staff members of our department for providing their support and encouragement at the time of need. On behalf of civil engineering department, I also like to acknowledge my sincere gratitude to the resource persons of the faculty development program to give their consent to deliver their talk in a very short span of time despite the busy schedule. I'm also very much grateful to all the team participants and their employees preparing their employees during this pandemic time to participate in this faculty development program. I also like to thank to our research scholars, Surya Munibhara, Vishwajit Maji, BTEC students, Satyadeep, Subham, Lokesh, who really worked hard behind the scenes to make it a great success. Last but not the least, a big thanks to all each of you who made this faculty development program memorable for us. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for delivering a vote of thanks. Now I welcome Professor Hemak B. Kosik, sir, who is currently a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering in IIT Guwahati. He is also the head of Center of Educational Technology in IIT Guwahati since August 2019. He is also a member of several professional bodies such as Athwaite Engineering Research Institute, USA, American Society of Civil Engineers, USA, the Masonry Hello. Society, USA, American Hello. Concrete Institute, Ooh. USA, his area of research interest is broadly on earthquake resistant design of structures, nonlinear behavior of structures, retrofitting of structures, seismic vulnerability assessment of structures, earthquake damage service, and so on. So we, so we wish a good luck for him for his uh, future research work. And he will have he has also received several awards, and one of them is David David Fiscati Award by. Preservation Engineering Technical Committee of the Association of Preservation Technology International, APT, USA, for his work on historic earthquake resilient structures in Nepal and other Himalayan regions and their seismic restoration. He has also uh, involved in various sponsored research projects, major consultancy projects, etc. Professor Hemant B. Kosik, sir, also guided several MTEC and PhD scholars and still guiding many. So in this today's session, he will mainly deliver talk on seismic behavior and analysis of confined masonry building. Now I'd like to welcome Professor Hemant B. Kosik, sir, to deliver his talk. Sir, over to you. Yeah, thank you. I hope I'm audible. Yes, sir, you're audible. Okay, very good morning to all of you. And uh, thank you for the nice uh, uh, Presentation. Let me share my slide. Okay. And let, let me know once you can see my slides. Can you see it? I can see. It is from NIT. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir, we can see. Okay, so uh, today's uh, presentation is about understanding what combined masonry buildings are and how they differ from the existing other types of buildings, what is their seismic behavior, and what are the possibilities of analyzing these buildings and designing these buildings. So, the common building types in India they can be classified in various forms. There are masonry buildings, reinforced concrete buildings, steel structures, wooden structures, and hybrid structures. Under 
each of them you will find several combinations. That is why the hybrid construction is written. So many times we have reinforced concrete buildings with masonry or steel structures with masonry or wooden elements. So hybrid construction is also very popular in India. Now under masonry structures, we have most popular ultra-enforced masonry construction, which is uh, basically formed, which forms basically the 80% of building stocks in India. More than 80%. If you go to villages, you will find most of the buildings in India is uh, made of unreinforced masonry. Then we have reinforced masonry construction, which are very, uh, I mean, limited in numbers in India. But if you go to other countries, other developed countries, most of the rain, most of the masonry buildings are reinforced. But in India, we don't provide reinforcement in uh, masonry buildings. Now the third category, and this is the confined masonry building. So this is somewhere in between the uh, uh, unreinforced masonry building and the reinforced concrete frame within pins. So that is what we are going to uh, discuss today. Now there are several deficiencies in unreinforced masonry building. First is, of course, there is no reinforcement. And uh, let us see how do we remove this deficiency by, by adding some other elements. Not reinforcement in masonry, but some other elements. So, why do we use this masonry? The primary reason of using this is the bricks are very economical and they are easily available in every part of the country. So, because of the affordability, it, it's so popular. So, then people thought that we can slightly modify the design, the construction, the configuration of these buildings to reduce the seismic vulnerabilities associated with unreinforced masonry. If you look at this map, which is a seismic hazard map of the world, so wherever you have dark colors, it is the region of high seismicity. So we have observed historically that the unreinforced masonry building have, have performed extremely poorly in all these regions. If you remember in the last 20 years alone, there are many earthquakes in Iran, in New Zealand, in China, where millions of such unreinforced buildings have collapsed completely. So these are also the regions where we have confined masonry construction very popular. Some of these regions, wherever you have the dark region, the red around that region. So there is a reason why people have actually moved over to the confined masonry construction. Let us discuss those reasons. If you look at the history, the, the construction of confined masonry buildings started way back in 1908. There was a very big earthquake in Italy, Messina, of magnitude 7.2, where large number of unreinforced masonry buildings collapsed. So after that, through a very informal process, people actually started modifying the configuration and design of unreinforced masonry buildings to reduce the seismic vulnerability. Because looking at the failure of these unreinforced masonry buildings, people could realize that what are the possible reasons why these buildings are failing. So let us try to improve them. These buildings are widely practiced in, uh, in several countries, the Latin American countries, the Mediterranean, Europe, and they have gained popularity in several seismic prone regions in Asian and African countries. So here are some of the photographs from Chile, Argentina, Mexico, Peru. You can find these buildings are two story to six story high. And the number of stories, of course, depend on the, the, uh, the quality of bricks. So in India, for example, we don't have very high strength bricks available. If you go from the width and uh, Depth of India, the, the, the strength of masonry varies from 2.5 MPA to 30 MPA. I'm talking about strength of, uh, opposite strength of single bricks, single brick. So with so much variation in the material properties, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to, to construct high-rise buildings, specifically the, the uh, confined masonry buildings. But then in countries where they have very good quality bricks, they have actually constructed up to six stories buildings also. And th these buildings are very popular in these countries. In India, it's not so popular formally, but if you go to villages, you will many, many times you will find that 
the confined masonry buildings are being constructed, but then they are, they, they are not realized that uh, the people don't realize that these are confined masonry buildings. What they do is they reduce the size of the columns and beams. Sometimes you will, you will find that there are just three bars in a column, the three longitudinal bars in a column, just to reduce the cost of the building. And the whole load is actually shared, uh, is taken up by the masonry. So these are similar to the confined masonry construction. Now let us see what is the primary difference between this confined masonry type of construction and the masonry infilled RC frames. Masonry infilled RC frames is very popular in the urban areas of India. So that is why I have chosen this comparison. So first I'll tell you how we construct the RC frames with masonry infilled. So this video shows the step-by-step -step process. First, we construct the frame, the columns and the beam. Once the columns and the beam is set, then we start constructing the masonry wall. Now, the way we design these buildings is such that the beam is actually designed to resist all the load that comes from the above. The columns are designed to resist all the loads that is coming from the above as well as from the lateral direction. So what is this masonry wall doing there? It is simply filling up the space just to create some partition. So the role of infill here is slightly different. It is, it is many, many times people uh, uh, assume these infill walls or they, they consider these infill walls as non-structural elements. The reason is this, because we design our frame to resist all possible loads and load combinations. But the infill wall is not even expected to resist the vertical load coming from the beam. Now let us see how do we construct the confined masonry building. So here it is, how do we construct? First we provide the reinforcement cage of the columns and the beams. Then we construct the uh, uh, bottom beam or the foundation. After that, the masonry wall, and then we construct these columns and the top beam. Now, what is the primary advantage of doing this? Why people do this? First is, of course, they save cost in the shuttering. So once the wall is there, it is not required to actually use the shuttering on all four sides of the column. One part of the, one, one edge of the wall, it acts as the shuttering for the column. Now, the size of the column and beam here is very less compared to the size in the RC frame. So there is the cost saving measure, another cost saving measure. Now, once you, once you construct these, these uh, RC elements, after construction of the masonry wall, the bond between this wall and RC elements becomes much better. So that is another advantage. But people can argue that we can do this even for reinforced concrete frame structures. Yes, but then there's a problem here. There's a problem there that we'll discuss later, but here, so the, the, the major difference is in the construction process, is in the way we build the wall as infill or as a major wall. There's a difference in the load transfer, how the load is transferred from one element to the another element. So the structural system is completely different if you look at these two types of uh, construction. And of course, there's a difference in the cost. So, if, if you look at the confined masonry construction, if I just show you one wall, one or two walls here, you can see the yellow uh, region in, in the left bottom figure. That is the RC element. Now, there's a two thing here. Now, this two thing, if you provide, so two thing means we, we uh, extend the column into the wall in adjacent, in, in uh, alternate uh, brick courses. So it actually further improves the bond between the wall and the column. So which is not actually possible in case of reinforced concrete frames. So this is one advantage that we get, but this is not easy. People generally avoid it because it's not easy. Now let us see what is the difference in the structural system, the load transfer part. So like I said, the role of masonry infill is not to resist the gravity load. So if you look this figure here in the right bottom, then you apply the lateral load, then the masonry infill wall kicks into the structural resistance. It resists this lateral load. 
but if there is a vertical load, it, it has no role to play. We'll discuss this issue uh, in detail later. In case of confined masonry building, the wall is completely load bearing. So the vertical load as well as the lateral load is resisted by, they are resisted by the uh, masonry wall. So it's completely load bearing. So the primary difference between these two systems then become we have to design the masonry wall in case of confined masonry building to resist all the possible loads. In case of infill RC frame building, we don't have to design this infill wall to take the gravity. Even we don't design it to take the lateral load. But then now we know that at least it, it helps resisting the lateral loads. So these are the key components of a confined masonry building. So we have, uh, of course, a foundation. So the foundation varies between building to building. If it's a small building, then this type of foundation strip footing is sufficient. If it's a high rise, five to six story, then individual walls, individual footings for columns and walls are required. Now, important point here is the columns are known as die columns, right? So, so it's not a regular reinforced concrete columns that are found in RC buildings. These are tie columns, and there is a reason why this tie word is added here because they help tying the walls together. So, the tie column is basically the vertical reinforced concrete confining element. So, it confines, it ties the walls together. They resemble a column in RC frame construction, but it's not really a column. It's only a tie column. Similarly, the tie beams, these are the horizontal RC confining members. So once you uh, confine this masonry wall inside these tie columns and tie beams, just like RC frame, you improve the behavior. And why do we improve? Let us discuss. Now, these are the simplified thumb rules or the layout rules that generally people follow when they construct the confined masonry walls. So the tie column spacing is, should always be less than four meters. So that is one important thing. But uh, this is also applicable to most of our RC frame systems. We don't generally employ spans of more than three to four meters. Four meters, four point five meters is the maximum. So this is not the actual advantage that we get in CM structures. So the advantage is different. So we provide these tie columns at the wall ends and all the intersections. We also provide these tie columns wherever you have any opening. The thickness of the wall will always be greater than 100 mm. Now, 100 mm thick wall, if you construct, you cannot construct more than a single story high building. If it's a four or five story high, of course, the thickness of the wall will increase depending upon the strength of the brick. So now you can imagine that if you are providing the, these tie columns, at the at both both ends of the openings, and you're providing these tie columns at all the intersections, at all the ends of the wall, then you are providing more confinement to the masonry wall, right? And it is actually difficult for these masonry walls to act alone. So in case of RC frame system, these masonry walls they act in the, as individual units inside that RC frame system. So let us uh, see how do we evaluate the seismic behavior of these confined masonry buildings. Now, what are the uh, parameters? So there's an as there's a then there's a huge influence of aspect ratio on the seismic behavior of these buildings. There's an influence of masonry strength, of course. We have been repeatedly uh, repeatedly saying that masonry strength governs the height of the building. There is a great influence of the vertical gravity loads that are acting on these confined masonry building. Then the influence of centralness ratio, meaning the, how thick the walls are. There is influence of concrete strength, of course, like in RC frame system. Influence of reinforcement in the tight members, but it, it depends. Like the, the present uh, scenario is that most of the people they follow some thumb rules in order to design these. Uh, time members. So reinforcement are just provided with four bars of 8 mm die or something like that. But then what we have observed that there is a significant influence of even the reinforcement in these time members. The Indian confined masonry code is presently under development. So interestingly, we don't have a code. But I'm hopeful that within six months or within a year, we'll be having 
uh, code. This will be a preliminary code which is under development. So the question that, questions that come to our mind that if these are the parameters on which the seismic behavior of confined masonry buildings depend, and we don't have a code available in India, then how do we model these buildings? How do we analyze them? How do we design them? So just simply saying that you saw the rules is okay for a single story building or maybe two story building. But then above that, you simply cannot use thumb rules because the system becomes too complex. The loading becomes too large that you have to have certain uh, design guidelines available. So these three questions we are trying to address with the help of one experimental study, the results of which I'll discuss today. A numerical study, which also comprises of a parametric study to uh, develop certain equations and finally the analytical study the, the empirical uh, to development of or development of the empirical equations so this is what we are going to discuss today so i will start with the experimental investigation so we consider like i said aspect ratio plays a very important role in seismic behavior of these buildings so we considered three aspect ratios 2.0, 1.5, and 1.0. And we tested half scale specimens of these frames in laboratory. The details of these specimens are given here. The, since our design code is not there, so we use the Mexican code to design these buildings. Now, when we say design, it's not really a complete design as it is there in RC, uh, RC frames. It, it's basically more of a uh, uh, guideline, more of thumb rules, but in addition to thumb rules, Mexican code also has some design equations, but not thorough. So these are the three uh, specimens, and you can see the size of the members here, 125 by 125. These are the size for the uh, tie columns and tie beam. The this is a uh, half scale model, so the, the even the bricks that were used here were half scale. They are manufactured in a, in a brick kin in half scale. These are the material properties that we consider. So you can see here the brick has the composite strength of 15.4 MPa only. It is not very high strength bricks. So this is the construction scenario. Like I said, we construct the uh, wall first and then we construct the time members or the RC members. So walls before the Concrete, masonry before the concrete. So the tie beam construction and with the slab construction is shown here. And uh, you can see the casting of the tie columns. So only two uh, directions the shuttering we need. The third direction is actually uh, provided by the masonry. These are the three constructed walls. One nicely painted, other before that. So height of the wall was kept same. And we changed the length just to change the aspect ratio. This is the experimental setup. So the lateral load, the earthquake load was applied in a simplified manner using this servo controlled hydraulic actuator at the, at the slab level. So this is the actuator using which we applied the lateral load to this specimen. The vertical gravity load on the wall was applied using these steel plates. The, the, the uh, load was applied only in this direction. So, and the frame is also stronger in this direction. So there was a possibility that the specimen may move in the out of plane direction. So these are the supports which were used to resist or to restrain the out of plane movement of the wall. With a strong floor for which the specimen was uh, fixed or anchored and the lateral displacement was measured the help of these aggregates. There were a large number of strain gauges installed in the uh, tie columns and tie beams as well. And this is how we apply the lateral drift. So this is a displacement control loading. So we apply the lateral drift slowly, incrementally till the failure of the specimen occurred. And uh, this is, I, I'm going to show you some videos here of the test specimens, starting with the very slender uh, 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 specimen with aspect ratio 2.0. So here you can find that the video is played in a fast forward manner because the actual time that took to complete the test was about three hours. 
but I'm showing you this in less than a minute. So you can see the X crack formation, which is very common type of uh, uh, failure mode in any masonry wall because of the formation of the tensile and compressive stresses in the cyclic loading. You can see the cyclic loading applied at the, at the top of the specimen with the actuator. And uh, so this is how the, the specimen failed at a uh, lateral displacement that we'll discuss later. Now the second specimen is, is uh, this one. It, it's a it's, uh, 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 very slow testing. So I'll just show you in a fast forward manner. Now this, the, the basic difference between the failure and this specimen and the previous specimen is very clear. That the failure is actually concentrated on the lower part of the frame, of the mason. And the X crack is also forming now at a lower level compared to the previous specimen, which was slender. And if I go on increasing the lateral drift, you see the same failure was actually enough. So the, the same cracks, they were enough thing. There was a gap between the frame on the tie cord and the masonry wall. And finally, the failure took place because of the shear failure of the column and of course the sliding bed, bed joint sliding failure as well as the shear failure in the uh, basically the tensile failure in the basically. The third specimen you will again find now that the failure again was shifted downwards. So as you go on increasing, as you go on reducing the aspect ratio, you see the, the formation of the cracks is actually started at the bottom of the specimen. And here are the diagonal cracks that are formed in the masonry wall. So these diagonal cracks they uh, 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 continue into the uh, C tie columns, and you can find right bottom corner here the shear failure in the tie columns, and also here it is beginning. So, like I said, the same cracks that formed in the initial stages they keep on increasing, and here you see the shear failure in the left column. Left tie column instead of the column, right column. So you can see here the difference in the three uh, frames. Very easily you can see, spot the difference that the, the, the cracking, the failure in masonry was very well distributed in the top as well as the bottom regions in the first specimen. But as you go on reducing the aspect ratio, the failure region goes on uh, downwards, it gets shifted downwards. And the reason is simple. This is a squat frame, aspect ratio 1.0. The first frame was very uh, 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 slender, so there are there were no frictional effects there. But in case of AR 1.0, the shear effects were dominant. And in 1.5, both the effects played a role. So this is the same thing. Uh, the before test and after test, you can see the three specimens. And in all the three, you will find the failure in the columns, tie columns, at the later stages. So this is uh, the, the primary failure modes in the three frames. And this slide, it shows the lateral load behavior in the, in the form of hysteresis loads. So along with that, the failure modes are also shown here. So you can find here that the strength of the lateral strength of first and second specimen did not differ much, right? But then the deformability differed by a significant amount. So the second specimen, it could, it could take very large amount of lateral drift, but the first specimen, because it was flexural in nature, once it reached the, 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 the uh, flexural capacity of the tie column, it failed. And the third specimen, because most of the lateral load is basically in all the three specimens, the lateral load is resisted by the masonry. But in the third specimen, because the amount of masonry was more, you will find that the strength, lateral strength was also more. But then, as expected, it, it because the failure was shear, it has to be subtle in nature. So though the capacity was much more here, it failed suddenly. And uh, it did not go up to higher lateral load. Now, why I'm showing you these results, the primary reason is to demonstrate that it is not easy to design or analyze these buildings. You cannot have a single method where you can actually design all these three different types of aspect ratios, uh, buildings with three different aspect ratios, because the failure modes are different, the way these buildings are behaving is different. So we have to have 
we, we must develop the analytical techniques and the modeling techniques and the design techniques considering this influence of aspect ratio in our mind. This is the comparison of the uh, three frames. So this is the only, I'm not showing the hysteretic response, but only the envelope curve. So like I said, the first two specimens, 2.0 and 1.5, they had more or less similar uh, strength, but the second specimen uh, deformed much more. So the ductility, we can say that if we can call it as ductility, uh, the, it was more. But the third specimen, the strength was much higher, about 25 to 30% or even 40% higher but it failed suddenly. So considering all these, we have to think about some modeling or analysis aspects. This slide shows various approaches for analysis of confined PCB structures. There's a, I mean, as far as the research is concerned, people follow 3D finite element modeling technique, which is very detailed, but you cannot model the entire building, three story, two story building using this. So therefore, you need to have simplified category of or approaches for analysis of same structures. So there are many approaches that people have been following. First is, of course, empirical methods. You don't do anything. Just there are some controls. And you provide this reinforcement, core bars, this dimension, this spacing, that's all. Then there are strut and type models, which are, again, not so simple to, uh, to, to uh, analyze because it requires certain amount of understanding on how different types of uh, different uh, uh, sizes of these walls are used. Okay? Wide column method, again, it, it's an approximate method of modeling. Again, very popular, but it, has, it also has its own limitations. The most popular uh, method that people generally use in case of reinforced concrete frames with infills is equivalent strut model. It is very popular. So we thought, let us see if we can actually use the equivalent strut model in case of unpacked visited buildings. So, like I said, there are several drawbacks of these exist existing approaches. Defined elements, finite element, element analysis, of course, the computational power uh, required is very high. There are many input parameters. Technical supervision is necessary. We don't have values for these input parameters easily available. But then we can still do it as far as research is concerned. Now, all the simple models that are the category two models are mainly used for linear analysis. And people have not primarily used them for displacement-based studies, again, because of requirement of large number of input parameters. But we can use this equivalent strut model in for non-linear analysis as well. So let us see if we can use this equivalent strut model, which is very similar or the, 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 the model used to, uh, to simulate the masonry infill walls. So can we use it to simulate the confined masonry wall as well? Let us first see how do we use this equivalent set model in infill RC frames. Like it is shown here, we replace the walls with these diagonal elements connecting the beam column joints of different frames. And we can do linear analysis, we can do non-linear analysis, depending on the properties available, properties of different variables. This, this type of analysis, it enables us predicting non-linear behavior. Now, why I'm repeatedly saying non-linear? Because unless you do a non-linear analysis, you will not be able to know what kind of failure mode this, this frame or this building experience. Okay, we can use linear analysis for design, but then for uh, simulating the failure, simulating the strength, nonlinear analysis is very much essential. So, what is the primary difference? If you remember the previous slides, the primary difference in the confined masonry building at the infill RC frame is the way the load is resisted. So, in confined masonry building, the masonry resist is expected to resist most of the load. The role of tie columns and tie beams is just to confine the wall, just to tie the wall. In RC frame, the infill wall is just there to create the space, to fill the gap. The loads are resisted by columns and beams. But then if you look globally, you will find that there is a good similarity between these two different types of structures. So from a distance, people will say that this is very much similar to 
and fit are set in confined nascent phase. So, in order to understand whether we can use this equivalent uh, strip method to analyze the confined nascent phase, the preliminary linear static analysis was carried out, in which we considered three types of uh, modeling techniques. In first, we consider uh, shell. Uh, we consider shell elements in SAR 2000 to model the confined nascent reward, and we use in all three models we used the beam elements or the frame elements to model the tie comments and the tie beams. So the first model was shell element model. The second element, normal diagonal strut model. This diagonal strut is similar to the the strut that we use in masonry intels. And the third model, just to compare the results, is without any intel. And so we considered uh, a past study carried out by Gabilan in 2015. So it's an experimental study. We took that frame and we tried to model it using different techniques. So Gabilan tested four frames. So we modeled uh, these four frames using these three techniques to understand what is the uh, 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 difference in the lateral load behavior if we use these three types of modeling techniques. Now we are using the linear static analysis here. So you can appreciate that the shell element model will give you the most desirable results because in linear, in linear analysis, you're not worried about the strength of the failure mode. You're simply worried about the connectivity between different elements. So if you model the shell element and the uh, tie columns and beams as, uh, uh, as frame elements, you connect them properly, so that connectivity will remain. So the shell element model will give you the most realistic results in this case. So we'll compare the shell element model with the diagonal strip model. So this is the uh, comparison in the action force distribution. So these are the four different experimental models, ME1 that had aspect ratio 2.5, ME2 with aspect ratio 1.73, ME3, 1.32 aspect ratio, ME4, 1.04 aspect ratio. So ME4 is basically the aspect ratio of one that we uh, tested, that yeah, we tested. So uh, if, if we consider ME1, and you can see here three types of modeling techniques, diagonal strut model, shell element model, and bear frame model. So in case of diagonal strut model, as well as bear frame model, about 50 50 50 percent of the actual load is resisted by the tie columns so this is basically the left tie column the black uh, shaded region here and this yellow region is the right tie column and this uh, orange color here is the wall is the action load resisted by the wall so in these two models the bare frame model as well as the diagonal strut model you can see that the actual load the vertical gravity load resisted by the confined masonry wall is almost zero, negligible. Most of the actual load, vertical gravity load, is resisted by the tie columns. Similarly, in ME2 also, you see here the actual load is zero, actual load is only 1%. Here in ME3, actual load is again very low, almost zero, ME4 also. So in all three and in all four models, the bare frame modeling technique and the diagonal strut modeling technique. The, the technique is such that it does not transfer any vertical gravity load onto the walls. Right? Most of the lateral, most of the vertical gravity load is resisted by the tie columns. But look at the shell element model. In all three elements, in all three, in all four models, and even any two, three, and four. You will find that the majority of the vertical gravity load is resisted by the uh, wall, and this is what we also know that the the dimensions of these tie columns and tie beams are so low, and the the, the the construction technique is such that we expect most of the vertical gravity load to be resisted by the masonry wall, and this is truly depicted by the shell element model only. Okay, so this is one important. Uh, conclusion that we made from this study. Now let us see what happens to the uh, tie beam deflection. So again, 
we are uh, comparing the timing reflections for all the four models by modeling with three different techniques. So if we use the diagonal strut model or the bare frame model, you will find that the, the vertical deflection of the tie beam is huge. It's about 12.5 mm, right, for a given uh, gravity load in this model. And for, for ME1, it is 0.54. But when we use the shared element model, the, the, obviously the vertical deflection of the tie beam will be negligible. Now this is because the, the vertical beam is actually resisted, is rested on the masonry wall, right? So we don't expect much uh, deformation, vertical deformation of the tie beam. But since in case of diagonal spread model or the bare thread model, there is nothing that resists that vertical deflection of the beam. Obviously the shell element model, uh, the, obviously these two elements, these two models, Will actually give you very large amount of lateral uh, vertical displacement. But shell element model is it again truly depicts very low lateral vertical displacement of the tie beam. So these two slides actually give us give us confidence that the diagonal strut model cannot be used to model to analyze the confined masonry buildings. As simple as that. But when I say diagonal strut model cannot be used, I mean in its entirety. Like in its current form, we cannot use it. So if you want to use it, we have to modify the regular strut model. Now, this is what happens in the two different types of two different uh, building uh, types. In case of RC infill frame, when we apply the lateral load, there is a gap here in, in off diagonal corners, but in the diagonal corners, there is a proper connectivity between the wall and the RC. But in case of confined masonry, when we apply the lateral load, there is no gap anywhere because the, the bond between these two uh, materials is very strong. There is no gap. So this is how we have to actually think about how to consider the lateral load in case of confined masonry building, in, in case of modeling the confined masonry building. So the, the RC frame is very stiff compared to the flexible confinement of uh, uh, CM wall. The, therefore, the ESM technique without modifications, like I already told you, it cannot be used. So there is a tremendous difference in the way th these two different building types behave, although they look quite similar. So we cannot use this equivalent static method as it is. Now, this is why we proposed a new model, which is the VD strut model. So if you look here, the, the, the stress flow pattern for gravity load, I mean, not, not in this figure, but what we have observed that the stress flow pattern is actually the stresses are concentrated towards the center when we are talking about the vertical gravity loads. So we have to actually uh, consider the realistic stress flow, flow pattern in, when we analyze. Second point is the distribution of the gravity load so like we have already seen, the, the distribution of the gravity load is such that it the 100% of the load is resisted by the tie columns if we model only the diagonal strut. So we need another element here that can help us to reduce the contribution of these tie columns in resisting the gravity load. Another point is the, the tie beam deflection must be reduced. So this vertical, that, the vertical strut here will also help us in reducing this vertical deflection of the beam. So we have incorporated a vertical strut in addition to the diagonal strut and we call it VD strut model, vertical diagonal strut model. Okay, so, but this is not sufficient. What we have observed is that along with this, we have to improve the, 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 the flexural stiffness of this tie beam. If you have to realistically simulate the lateral load behavior of the confined masonry wall. So these are the modifications that we are proposing in the equivalent strut model for infill wall, right? So it, it should have a vertical strut and it should also have a modified models and increased flexural rigidity. Now the questions are, what will be the dimensions of this diagonal strut? 
what will be the dimensions of the vertical strut, how much we have to improve, increase the modulus of elasticity or the moment of inertia, so EI. So these are some of the questions that we, are, we will try to uh, answer with these finite element simulation and analytical state. Now, we carried out large number of studies using this VD strut model. And uh, what we are showing here is on the vertical axis is the normalized axial force in the tie columns. And on the horizontal axis is the normalized width of vertical strut. So WVS is the uh, width of the vertical strut. So, and K denotes the tie beam stiffness. So it's a combination of various parameters. So we kept on changing the width of the vertical strut. We also kept on changing the stiffness of the tie beam. And then we observed what is the normalized action force uh, in the tie columns. So one means this is what we need. So this is the, the ideal response one. So we have to choose a solution where the normalized action force is one. So that means the, the forces are normalized with respect to the strut, with respect to the shell forces. This is a zero error line, right? Now, what we observe that when we go on increasing the value of K, so that means when we go on increasing the stiffness of the tie beam, of course, the action forces go on increasing. So you can find here the action forces, the normalized action forces, they go on increasing. Also, when we increase the width of the vertical strut, then also uh, as, as we go on in increasing the k, the actual force improves, but then for constant k, for the same value of k, the actual force reduces. Now, if you look here, you can very easily see that this red line at which, for which k is equal to 20, gives you good number, like right? where we have, and it is on the I mean, on an average, it gives you good results. All others, this doesn't even reach one yellow, and these two lines, they reach one, but it is very eccentric in nature. But this red line, it more or less simulates properly. <clears throat> then we also compare the results considering the normalized displacement of the beam, vertical displacement, delta. Again, this is a zero error line. So here also you can see that now you can uh, simulate the results with even higher values of k. So obviously, if you want to reduce the vertical deflection of the tie beam, you have to increase the, the stiffness of the tie beam. So that is what is shown here. So for higher stiffness, the vertical displacement will reduce. So again, the value of k is equal to 20 appears to be uh, in good agreement here on an average. For that value, the normalized WVS comes out to be about 0 0.7, 0 0.75. And here also, the normalized WVS is about 0 0.7 to 0 0.75. So then we clubbed all these numbers together. So this figure, this figure, I'm showing you normalized action forces, normalized displacement, and normalized width for vertical strength. So like I told, <clears throat> this value here, is actually reaching line of zero error, right? So this is the axis for the action force. It is reducing here. This is for the axis for one by normalized delta, right? And this is the, the, the line of optimum points. So for different uh, combinations of WVS, normalized action force, and normalized delta. So this, uh, 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 line of optimum points, which shows that this is the point which we can actually consider. So this is the optimal point which we can consider. And here we are now showing another way of, uh, I mean, we are showing similar results, but in slightly different way. So both the numbers are shown on the, uh, on the left axis, and we are showing for all the four frames now, ME1, ME2, ME3, ME4. So for all the frames, if you look at k is equal to 20, so for this frame here, k is equal to 20 is erroneous. But for these two frames, it gives very good results. Even for this frame, k is equal to 20 gives very good results. 
But what we observe from this figure is that K varies between 5 to 20 and width of vertical strut varies between 0.63 to 0.9 length of the bone. This is what we can see. So this is the range. So if we then consider K is equal to 20 and WVS is 0.75 and W, then you can find here that this approximation is actually excellent. So for all the four frames, ME1, ME2, ME3, ME5, we considered this and we found that the error is not much. So the error corresponds to the difference between this line here and this point here at K is equal to 20. And so this is the error in the normalized action force. And this error, this horizontal is the error between the normalized displacement. So obviously for the very, uh, for ME1 in which the aspect ratio was uh, 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 very high, the error is more, but the aspect ratio was too high in this case. It was 2.75. Generally, we don't find buildings or walls in which aspect ratio is 2.75. So even if the error is more here, it, it's quite acceptable because it's unrealistic frame. For all other three, you can see that the error is very low. So here come the final VD strut model then. So we have seen that the, we can improve the stiffness of the beam by about 20 times. And we can have the width of the vertical strut as 0.75 the width of the wall. The width of the diagonal strut can be similar to the width of strut that we use for masonry pins. That is about D by 3, diagonal length by 3 or diagonal length by 4. The other dimension of the strut the thickness will be equal to thickness of the wall. So this is what is shown here. Now, if we do this, we get the same initial thickness as the experimental, experimentally obtained thickness under lateral wall. So then we try to consider this model, VD strut model, and do a nonlinear analysis. This is how we consider the nonlinearity in the materials. We model the shear hinges in the straight uh, tie columns, tie beams, and this is the uh, masonry action hinge considered from past days. And this figure shows the location of the plastic hinges. I hope uh, some of you must be knowing this process. I'm not going into too much detail here. But unfortunately, what happened when we carried out the nonlinear static pushover analysis in SAT 2000? This is the behavior. So this is the experimental curve, the, the solid line, and the analytical curve is like this. So although we, we could match the initial stiffness, but the strength was too high in case of analysis. And the reason is reason for this over prediction is very simple. We missed one really important point that the, the failure in the confined masonry is very brittle. Failure of masonry. The, there's a shear failure at the brick motor interface in the form of bed joint sliding. And also there's a step uh, cracking along the length of the wall. There's a mixed mode failure. But when we consider the diagonal strut modeling or even the VD strut modeling, what I did, we consider the strength of this uh, strut corresponding to the masonry composite strength, strength, FM prime, which considers only the crushing of masonry. And the strength is very high, and our prime is very high compared to the shear strength of masonry or the tensile strength of masonry or the mixed mode, the strength corresponding to the mixed mode failure. So obviously the strength coming from the analytical model was very high. So then we thought that it is not proper to use FM prime then. So we have to use something else. And that something else should actually correspond to the weakest failure mode of all the possible modes of failure in confined masonry. So therefore, we thought that there is a new term required, which is effective shear strength of masonry. So instead of FM prime, we have to consider effective shear strength of masonry. That will represent the minimum strength for the weakest failure mode in confined masonry walls. So what we initially did, we thought that, okay, we will try to keep on reducing this FM prime such that this lateral strength, experimentally obtained strength is matched. So this is what we got, very interesting results. So this is the FM prime for the four frames. 
the curve for the FM prime stress strain curve. And when we keep on reducing it such that we get the, uh, and this is, this is, this, this figure actually shows you the comparison of the experimental and the analytical results. So when we reduced it to 0.75, from 5.53, we reduced it to 0.75, then we match the results, right? And it is not only about reducing the strength, it is reducing the entire stress strength curve. So there was a method that was followed to reduce this curve to this curve. And we could actually get a very good result here for all the four specimens. But the, the problem was this reduction was not constant. You can see here in frame ME1, the FSS was only 0.75. Whereas in the fourth frame, the FSS was more than double. So then the question was how much we should reduce. So this is a very poor method of reducing FM prime to FSS. This is not an engineered method. I mean, we are just following, we are just trying to calibrate the results such that our analytical results match with the, uh, the, the, the experimental results. So this is a very poor way of doing this. So then we tried a very uh, improved method by carrying out a parametric study. So what we did, we considered several parameters, important parameters. So first was a prime. We varied FM prime from 3 to 30. Then FCK was varied from 20 to 30 in 3 increment. Aspect ratio was varied from 0.75 to 1.75 in 5 increments. I mean 4 increments were fine numbers. Sigma V means the vertical gravity load acting on these walls. It was varied from 0.1 to 0.65. It's, it's basically the stress acting on the wall. The, the uh, row is the uh, reinforcement percentage in the tie columns. It was varied from 0.6 to 2. And the thickness of the wall was varied from 100 to 250. Now you can imagine that so many parameters and we, we developed all these models. These are about 1620 numerical models were developed. And we thought, let us carry out a detailed finite element study to understand what is the reduction in the FM prime so that we can find out FSS. So you can find here that these are the uh, frames. These are the five aspect ratio, which we considered. OK, so. Uh, we first carried out the finite element study, find out how the frame behaves, what is the strength, and then we considered the same frame 620 models. We again model it in uh, model these uh, frames in SAP 2000 and compare or calibrate the lateral strengths. So the finite element model was carried out in uh, modeling was done in Abacus. Even the validation was also done in Abacus. And there are several complex models available in Abacus. I will not go into too much of detail, just I'll uh, go through these slides. So many properties are required actually here, which are not required in case of nonlinear pushover analysis. So we consider these the concrete damage plasticity model to model to consider the plastic properties of concrete as well as masonry, because it is suggested in literature, and all these properties wherever we could get the, uh, the, the the values for these parameters in the literature. We have to consider some parameters we obtained in the laboratory and some parameters were considered as default given in the uh, abacus. Because uh, there are some parameters which, which, which are not easily obtained, which cannot be obtained easily in the laboratory. So this is the CDP model and uh, these are the stress strain relationships for masonry, compression, and tension that was considered. Now, here we have to model the tension uh, properties because finally the masonry is not going to fail in compression. It is either going to fail in the shear between the mason between the bricks and the mortar, or the shear between the masonry and the tie columns or tie beams, or the stepped joint cracking the bed joint sliding or the step crack. So tension behavior is very important to model. So this is a simplified modeling technique that we used. We considered the peak tensile strength as 9% of the peak compressive strength. So this all is based on some literature. 
is there stress in curve for concrete we considered in compression and tension also like i said tension modeling is very important here because the cracks are formed and we have to actually simulate these cracks uh, this is the uh, uh, stress in curve for reinforcement and uh, and these are the finite element uh, these are the modeling parameters that are used for the uh, concrete damage plasticity model so dilatation angle eccentricity and all these parameters were considered the range is given in the uh, manual and we have considered these values so some some sort of calibration was was carried on uh, by considering the original experimentally obtained results so after the calibration we used the calibrated model to analyze 1620 models in a batch and this is the finite element model where we applied the in plane cyclic drift it is not the monotonic analysis but the cyclic analysis we also applied the pre compression at the top the masonry concrete interface was defined the embedded constraint was defined in the steel for modeling the Masonry, we used eight coded brick elements, C3, D8, R, and for modeling the uh, reinforcement, we used two coded truss elements. The uh, C3, D8, R was also used to model the concrete, and the uh, some inset is also shown here how different uh, elements were considered. So these are uh, the the initial validation scheme. well initial validation of the results so you can see that we could actually uh, simulate the lateral load behavior in a very nice manner so you can find the the black lines here are the experimental results the dotted red lines are the numerical results and they match more or less in a quite uh, uh, good way so there is of course some error but that error is acceptable there is there is not much error when we consider only the strength obviously the, the entire curve there will be some uh, mismatch but then we are not worried about that mismatch at this stage what we are worried about here is the change is the difference in the lateral strength only because that lateral strength will actually give us a method to evaluate fss so that is the whole idea here so this is the result of the parametric study of all 620 models so this figure shows you the variation in the lateral strength with respect to aspect ratio for three different thicknesses 100 200 and 250 thickness of the wall and for three values of fm prime 3.0 5.5 8.5 so you can find clearly that there are these three bands right for all the thicknesses of the walls so these three bands they correspond basically to the three grades of uh masonry three three compressive strengths of masonry so we know this figure shows you the variation between the lateral strength and the fm prime when we change aspect ratio and the thickness so for all thicknesses we have the similar bands right so what we observe that we when we increase the aspect ratio the lateral strength is going to reduce and that is what we have also seen in the experimental study plus in case of very low aspect ratio we found that the variation in the lateral strength is much higher for different fm prime but for higher aspect ratio the variation is less so depending on that depending on uh, the, the these results we carried out a, a regression analysis so it's basically an constrained multiple variable linear regression analysis of all the data that we uh, obtained from the pushover analysis and we developed these equations for estimation of the fss so if you remember the idea was not to use fm prime in the analytical models because it gives you very high strength obviously because the failure is different so here for aspect ratio more than one this equation you can see here that fss depends on the thickness it also depends on fm prime it depends on fck it depends on this the steel percentage in the tie columns the actual stress of the wall and the aspect ratio 
Now it's very easy to know, it's very easy to guess which is the most important variable here. Fm prime, of course, is the most important. So because you can see the power of this Fm prime is 0.886. Now, obviously, I have been telling you that the strength of the wall, the strength of the brick, Fm prime is basically the strength of the masonry prism. So, strength of the brick governs the configuration and the size of the building. So, FSLs obviously depend on Fm prime. Now, we will not use Fm prime directly, but we are using only Fm prime to the power 0.886. Modified by using all these parameters. So, if you remember, I showed you four uh, results. So, FM prime was reduced in one case to 0.75 from 5, so about uh, maybe eight times reduction. In another case, it was about 1.55. So, this equation, if you use, there's no need to actually worry about how much reduction is required. Because it depends on all these parameters, you can directly get the value of FSS. But the same FSS is not applicable for the entire range of AR. Obviously, because you found that what happens for different range of AR, the, the variation in the strength is different. So for low values of AR, AR less than 1, less than or equal to 1, the equation is slightly different. So here the AR comes in the numerator, right? So it increases actually. FSS increases further. And obviously it has to be like that. Now, how good are these equations? So these two figures here, they show the goodness of fit. So the R squared value obtained by comparing the empirically predicted FSS. So these equations, the, the predictions given by these two equations and the numerically obtained FSS is very high, right? So this this equation gives you very good uh, prediction. Similarly, you know, we are going to get that equation to one. This prediction is very high. Ask the value of it. But of course, in some cases, you can find some errors up there. These errors are, I think, less than fifteen percent, ten to fifteen percent. And those who are working in masonry, they will appreciate that. 15% mirroring basically is not much. It's quite acceptable. And we actually become very happy if we get 15% error. Because generally we get 25 to 50% error in masonry. Now, it was very essential to validate this FSS using the certificate we started more. What we did. We consider large number of previous experimental study. The x axis shown here is actually representing various experimental studies carried out by past researchers. So we consider those studies, we model those studies using the VD start model as well as the finite element model. And then we try to see what is the difference in the predicted uh, uh, shear and the experimental shear that is obtained in the uh, uh, studies. So this one here represents zero error. Again, this dotted line is the zero error line. And these values are the ratio of the predicted shear to the experimental shear. So you can find that there are some studies where you have a uh, large error. But of course, that those studies in which the error is large it, uh, they are less in number, but there are many studies which are actually falling very near to this line. So these equations, the, this method of VD strut model, using FSS, using higher stiffness for time beam, is very helpful. This figure shows that. Now, there is another interesting point in this figure that we not only try to validate our model by considering single story test results, but also the multi-story test. So there are certain tests here which were multi-story, so two-story. And the model actually worked very fine even with two-story. So, and these stars and plus, they represent different types of tests. So wherever we have, uh, uh, for example, there, there may be some test in which the aspect ratio value was too different than what we consider. 
So we considered from 0.75 to 1.75. So this is the range of aspect ratio generally available in the literature. Generally, people use in real construction. But there are studies in which people have actually used very high values, 2.75 to 3 aspect ratios. Then there are some studies in which the thickness of the wall was very different. So we are not bothered about those studies much. But the important point here is most of these studies, the error is less than 10 to 15 percent. And which is very heartening because the VD strut model that we just observed is very simple to uh, use. So in summary, this uh, suitable alternative is the, con the, the confined masonry is, is, is the suitable alternative to seismically vulnerable underinclosed masonry and non-ductile RC frame buildings as far as the low and medium rise construction is concerned. Again, I'm stressing the, the quality of masonry governs how good is the quality of confined masonry buildings. But for any quality of masonry, the confined masonry building will be much better than unreinforced masonry. Any quality. Moreover, for any quality of masonry, the confined masonry buildings will be much better than non-ductile RC frame buildings, even in seismic zone, high seismic zones. And the reason is simple, because when we construct the RC frame buildings with infills, we expect some response from these RC frames, from these RC elements, the columns and beams. We expect ductility, and which is not easy to provide because people don't follow the codes. So when the earthquake struck, our expectations are dashed and we get very poor response. So therefore, the confined masonry buildings in which we do not actually expect any ductility from the, from the tie columns. So they, they, they can behave in a much better way. And obviously, like I said, that 80%, more than 80% of the Buildings in India are steel and reinforced masonry. This type of construction, the confined masonry construction, is much suitable. We can train the local masons very quickly because they already know how to do this. Only certain things are required. We can impart the training to them. As far as economy is concerned, they are very much comparable with unreinforced masonry. There are very low amount of concrete and steel required here. So it's also, these types of buildings are also economically very feasible. We can reduce the seismic vulnerability of the region if we stop using URM buildings, but we start constructing CM buildings. We can modify the URM buildings to CM buildings. That way we can actually reduce the seismic vulnerability. We have proposed some uh, uh, analytical model, some numerical model in this study, the VD start model, which is actually very handy to model even the uh, big structures because it just required a diagonal strut and a vertical strut, not in a detailed finite element modeling. With some little bit of modification in the FF prime, we reduce the FF prime to FSS and use VD strut model. We can be uh, and we can analyze these buildings very in a very easy manner, and then depending on the force resultants that gives after the analysis, we can design these. Buildings. Design in the sense the design of the tie columns and tie beams. Design of the masonry can be done as the usual process given in the code as one nine zero. So that is all uh, from my side. I wish to thank the Department of Science and Technology for supporting this study. The finances, uh, the funding was given by them. All these results, all these slides belong to my PhD student Bonisha Bora, who is there in this photograph. Uh, this is the second frame that she tested. I thank Dr. Vaibhav Singhal from IIT Patna, who is also a co-investigator in this study. And I also thank Professor Svetlana Brase from UBC uh, for giving me some of these slides. So thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, then we can discuss. Yes, your participant, you have, uh, I hope you will have many questions. Uh, please ask and feel free to ask questions. And you make yourself uh, the video on, and you just unmute yourself, and you ask the question. Professor Mukherjee, Professor Sonali Bhumi, do you have any questions? I think you should have. 
if uh, you can ask the question in favor of the student also because uh, many student may have the doubt but they are hesitating to ask questions but you can also ask uh, i have a simple question yes i have a very simple question fantastic fantastic work done uh, of course you said this is a phd student work i am sorry i just put on the light sorry you can see that the participant uh, age limit also is very uh, very uh, this is a nice uh, you know nice effort uh, nice program being uh, conducted by uh, nit raukela and by professor mondol is uh, well coordinated uh, nice effort and i have been watching and i have been watching uh, professor uh, uh, throughout this lecture it was a nice work uh, only thing i have a small question uh, maybe on behalf of my students here in i, I am from uh, a private institute in engineering college hiradu department uh, in uh, near kolkata uh, so we have some uh, problem in infrastructure as like we are not at par uh, with what you have resources are limited uh, so i just wanted to know uh, did you did you um, uh, develop the uh experimental setup yourself or you just uh, bought it uh, uh, from the market of some manufacturer uh see most of the experimental setup was developed in house okay but the the displacement control setup was actually purchased directly from big companies like mts hbm yeah. and uh, biz so so the 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 instruments were purchased the equipments were purchased but the strong floor the reaction walls those were all constructed in house here so oh, that's great but what about the calibration that you have got tested by them no they came and they calibrated the machines okay that's what i am saying so yes. after installation they calibrated the machine as per the experiment yes. you are yes and every year we calibrate them because that is must that's calibration that's every year is a must that is a good great great work so fantastic and uh, i just wanted to uh, know slight bit of if you can just put some light about the applicability of i have some doubt about you know we can find out the forces and uh, the effect uh, but uh, sometimes for very important structures or buildings we try to do it uh, earthquake resistant to uh, as far as the our uh, 50 years or 20 years record goes you know based on that but uh, is it really a uh, work uh, doing the same work same resistant uh, uh, to some uh, this kind of residential buildings where you just do it with masonry sometimes in reinforced or sometimes unreinforced whether that really work practically or uh, we have something we can just think about it there is some scope in doing that so there are codes available in india but the the for example if i talk about only the unreinforced masonry buildings there is a code is 1905 yeah unfortunately that code does not talk about reinforcement it is purely unreinforced masonry right. and what we have found in throughout the globe throughout the world whenever there is a big earthquake in any region that has unreinforced masonry building even in developed countries like new zealand in 2012 13 there was a big earthquake thousands of buildings collapsed so therefore we must have a code in which now we should learn to provide the reinforcement because they provide ductility they improve the conformability of these uh, brittle elements same is true for reinforced concrete now we have a code for ductile detailing in reinforced concrete 13920 is there but then the problem is many people they don't use it yeah just to save the cost but we have found in, in any earthquake whenever there is a even a moderate earthquake you will be surprised that when i visited uh, sikkim after this 2006 very small earthquake of 5.7 magnitude only and there were more than 20 buildings that suffered major damage and the whole the major reason was they did not follow the code the ductile detailing codes yeah of course this this helps actually if we follow the code if we provide ductile detailing this is going to help 
basically you, you mean to say the collateral damage will be less yes so immediate collapse will not be there maybe some some flexible collapse will be there so do you have yes. some time to get survive yes so this yeah, is the very basic very design. Design. this is the basic design philosophy of our yeah. design that we expect some damage because the energy of the seismic waves has to be dissipated right. and it is dissipated by some damage some crack formation but then we don't allow the collapse exactly So another just last question. I just wanted to because you, you did lot of work on this. So I just I just wonder whether uh, this kind of you know making the building uh, uh, earthquake resistant or reducing the uh, collapse or reducing the uh, form of collapse and kind of uh, avoiding the uh, damage, uh, big damage, huge damage. Uh, it, it, will it be will it be really worth thinking about uh, some base isolation in foundation itself? Or uh, yes. doing that in the superstructure, or uh, keeping the foundation the same conventional way. Mm, yes, yes, very nice actually. This is what people do if the building is very important. The base base isolation is a costly affair. It's not very simple, not very easy to do. You need costly equipments. So for big important structures, people do this base isolation. Or maybe for heritage structures, very old structures. People have actually lifted the entire structures, provided the base isolation, and then again supported. Right. So it is it is perfectly okay. And in fact, in IIT Guwahati, uh, we have developed. There is a group of uh, persons who have developed a very low cost base isolation device. Okay. So it is it is about hundred times lesser cost That's than great. that we purchase from other countries. Kinematrix is a is a company which provides base isolation devices to most of the countries. But this this homegrown technique is much uh, cheaper. Oh, oh. Professor, Go Professor Goshi, can we can we get those uh, you know information about those uh, material or those uh, system? Uh... Yes, I will. I will tell you. Just send me an email. I will uh, give you the details. Okay, I I, I will get your email uh, through Professor Mondol, right? Yes, yes, yes. I will provide. Yes. Okay, okay. Please, please uh, give me that. Uh, you can put it on uh, WhatsApp group also. Okay. Yes, okay. Thank you, Professor Kosik. It was nice uh, watching you and discussing with you. And thank get, you. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Now, any participant? And do anybody have any question? So Please feel free to ask. Deepak Kumar Sahu has written. Okay. Uh, yes. Can we apply two diagonal strut model to replace the masonry instead of single strut to match with the results? Sir, uh, sir, I have one more doubt. Uh, yeah. How will put the diagonal strut during the construction time or after the construction? Because uh, this, this diagonal strut is a modeling technique. It is not okay. there in the structure. We replace the wall in the analytical model by this strut. Oh, okay. that I understand. But I thought that. Uh, Uh, because some some reinforcement uh, some retrofitting technique i observed some paper they used to say that uh, if you put diagonal go that uh, if you put diagonal uh, that start some member or wire uh, then the crack can be uh, avoided or it can be minimized yes. these are braces the braces oh I... braces yes. okay so the uh, question asked by deepak actually uh, different researchers have actually tried various uh, techniques they have uh, tried modeling the masonry using two strut three strut five strut seven strut even 13 struts the best result is given by you can say the three strut model so why do people model different why do people consider different number of struts the reason is if you remember this once there was one slide in my presentation when the lateral load increases of this infill wall rc frame infill wall the gap in the off diagonal corners it increases gap between the infill wall and the rc frame now in order to simulate this increase in the gap people model different number of people model this wall using different number of struts so when the gap increases one by one this strut fails so different researchers have tried using uh, doing that but then it it's very difficult to even model a two story building with multi multi uh, diagonal struts So therefore, the single diagonal strut element is the most popular element as far as the designers are concerned. 
for researchers you feel free to consider whatever number you want to consider anybody else actually uh, no one is asking question so i am asking in the, some question in favor of the student uh, what happened i would say that uh, many participants uh, are from uh, some private colleges or government colleges they don't have lab facility okay so i am asking that uh, what type of uh, research they can start with a minimum facility suppose some btech student and mtech student want to do research in your topic uh, but they don't have much all the facility so with a minimum facility whether a simple experiment or some numerical modeling what type of thing they can start in your early career see uh, if, if even if they don't have good experimental facilities it does not matter because for example i am giving this vd strut model now my question my major concern is the material properties of this masonry vary hugely across india so if you even if you have if, even if different people have small labs where they can test masonry prisms at least or masonry or brick units mortar cubes if you can develop the masonry properties in laboratory and use these different masonry properties in the vd strut model or the diagonal strut model or even in abacus it can also be a good study we don't have much data over the masonry properties okay so student can directly use some abacus uh, it is a licensed version you can use because we should not promote a crack version crack version is available but we should not promote it uh, okay so you can use uh, star as you sale model you can try the 3d model also and yes. uh, and one more thing we observed that uh, there is no is code for the reinforced brick wall okay so i hope uh, the sir inform that that code will come uh, in recent future and one more thing you should remember that our code is for the practitioner okay so now if you want to do research here also you can contribute uh, sir has conducted some regression analysis that type of analysis you also can do you can take the data which is presented in the paper and you can do your regression analysis with a minimum cost in matlab also uh, you can use you have to take the data from some researcher and you have to do the regression analysis and come out that uh, some result and what i is uh, taking okay that uh, since the is code will come that thereafter you will have a huge scope to do some research because there is some scope to develop the is code in much better way that will be beginning for beginner code okay and that code is for the practitioner not for the researcher so you can do research on that topic and you can also contribute to the is code also i hope i am correct yes okay. yes okay oh. okay so so what i understand that uh, Uh, people are already uh, get some idea about the brick masonry and they also get some idea that about that code and that, that code will come for the practitioners you also can do some sort of research there to verify the code and if there is some mistake you can correct it okay in the code so you can do your own research in the topic and experimental facility you have observed and sir also have uh, uh, discuss about that experimental facility you also can try to develop with that Your channel section, I section, because that earthquake load is normally come in that magnitude is very heavy, very high. So in that case, you should have a rigid frame, okay. And that for that case, you should think of uh, to develop a uh, that external facility at your end. And sir, I want to ask uh, some questions. What should be the uh, cost? Suppose any uh, institute want to develop your setup, okay. What will be the cost for them? Minimum See, cost. Want, yeah, minimum cost. If you want to develop one simple facility for testing, let us say, uh, full scale frame, three meter high by three meter width frame for cyclic loading, mm -hmm. then the cost of uh, good, very good quality. I mean, in fact, the best quality actuators which can apply the displacement control loading mm -hmm. is about uh, one and a half crores. Okay, fifty lakhs. One point one point five crores. One point five crores. Okay, okay. Yes. In addition to that, you will need a strong floor. Yes. And reaction uh, frame assembly. So you can say about two crore rupees with with the help of two crore rupees, you can develop a uh, similar kind of small facility. Okay, basically, uh, then the participant need to apply for project proposal uh, to the DST uh, or some other uh, funding agency. because yes. many of are not knowing that uh, 
uh, that SCRB, DST are there who is to fund uh, for the project. So if you are interested, you can write a project proposal. TKIP has a huge grant for development of the labs. Yes, yeah, TKIP also have the huge grant. You also can apply and you can try to develop uh, some sort of lab. I hope these things uh, will help you. Uh, this workshop, this, this faculty development program will help you in this regard. So you can learn some topic and you can also learn how we can develop with some minimum facility, uh, how we can get the grant, all the source you can know. So okay. Deepak has again asked one question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He wants to know how did I calculate the vertical load and the lateral load for the experimental model? Yeah, good question, Deepak. The vertical load was calculated by considering a two-story building. And uh, we, we considered the bottom story of that two-story confined masonry building. And corresponding lateral load was applied on that. Uh, sorry, vertical load. And the lateral load, we did not calculate. Because we, we kept on increasing the displacement till it fades. So the lateral load that we got from the experimental studies is the lateral strength of the specimen. Deepak, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. That also will be better. You will have good interaction with the professor. He's happy typing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, one more thing the, for the participant point of view. Uh, see, uh, there are very highly talented participants uh, outside NIT and IIT circle. Okay, so probably they are wondering how to do some sort of research, whether there is some facility at your college to have internship or some other uh, thing so that things so that uh, participants participant go there and go there and, and, some and, some sort of and, and, and verify, and verify and their, in their model in their model your in your college. Yes, so, uh, yes. Uh, one question I just wanted to ask. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. Yes, uh, you have uh, discussed about the FEM model in which uh, you have predicted the behavior. So in that scenario, the uh, bricks are interlinked with each other. So for the Abacus model, I mean, uh, what kind of uh, modeling aspects are being taken to take into consideration the interbonding between individual brick units? See, the modeling, modeling shown, shown, is the macro the model. Macro model. So, so the individual brick were not modeled because it takes it long takes time, time, time to model, but also to also no, time, 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 time. So, so it is a it is a micro micro macro model where, where all the all the all was modeled was modeled as a day. But the interaction interaction uh, elements, elements, psychologs, 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 using the friction element, the friction element, as well as, as well as, failure, failure, was a failure model given in these slides. Okay, sir. Okay. okay. Actually, it was very good question. Very good question. Uh, uh, because uh, that sir probably did not consider the bonding failure between the two brick layer. It's probably the question is like that, if I understand correctly. Yes. Yes. Okay, so see, there is some scope of research. You also can, that will be time consuming because earthquake loading uh, and your nonlinear behavior itself a difficult job to conduct. And if you consider the bonding between the layers, it, it will be too much complicated at that time. Okay, so, but but, is we don't have material models ready. Yes, yes. To give input of all these parameters. Yes. So when the models are not ready, then we have to give something as input. And then we don't know what is the output. So the, the, the confidence that we have in the results, it actually reduces. Therefore, it is always advisable to first use simplified models to get the confidence in the results. So if there is some scope of research, you, uh, you can still can carry out that type of research. Uh, Professor Mukherjee probably have some more questions. Yeah, no, actually this is for you, not a question. Actually, I was just wondering, are you going to go uh, give some uh, study material on the lectures? Or finally something? Uh, we are like recording that? it, we are recording it. So I will download it and I'll share in a uh, in your yeah. mail or uh, some of, I will find out the way to share with you. Acha, you just send the, you just uh, will share the uh, recording of the, uh, this thing. Yes, either I'll no, upload no, it. No, no uh, sir, that, will, that will be better if you see the lecture again and your idea will be clear. 
No, that's fine. But for for uh, uh, document to share with others, uh, if if those PPTs uh, could can, could be made available, I think Actually, that. Actually, I asked sir, but the PPT size almost 400 MB, so cannot be shared in the mail and all that. There is some information no, also. Share some other helpful material, which will, yeah. all this discussion will be there. I will then share some material. Oh, sir, okay. Sir, whatever the service sir, I will send to you. Okay. Okay. Please. So you you please call, try to continue this uh, sharing of the in uh, you know um, materials. Uh, yes, uh, sure, class sure. materials. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay. So, to leave uh, now because I have some classes. So thank you, okay. Professor Mundal and Professor uh, Kausik. Thank you. Okay. Sir. I'll leave now. Okay. Thank you very much. See you. Okay. See you uh, in the afternoon. Okay. So. Uh, anybody else some questions otherwise i'll ask last question in terms of in the in the for the internship and other thing and then we'll conclude this lecture is anybody have any question the participant uh m tech b tech creative school you should have some queries you should ask okay there is some comment for you sir the work has generated a lot of ideas about how to continue to expand my skill and my professional qualification. I feel uh, it will help me. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Kosik sir, uh, for his shared knowledge. Oh, thank is you. Is there anybody want to say something? So actually, I was asking about the internship. Uh, Sarah uh, asked the other question. So how, uh, suppose, uh, some private institute for institute from some private college or government college, so they have very less facility. So can they go there to your college and do some experiment as a uh, in, uh, internship or some sort of other uh, fellowship or short term duration, and and then they can come to your, their college and carry out the numerical modeling. Is there any way? Of course, of course they can do. See, every year we receive uh, about three thousand five hundred students as summer interns. Okay. Every okay. year. Okay. So obviously they can come, they have to apply. There is a specific process which is yes. there, online application they have to apply. And depending on number of seats available, depending on number of hostel rooms available, we actually admit them. Okay. And unfortunately, okay. unfortunately, this year we, we could not I mean bring anybody, we could not yes, brought anybody yes. because of the yes. pandemic. Yes, yes. But even then, the online internship was carried out by at least uh, five, six hundred students that I know. Oh, okay, that's great. So that I hope that participant will get some help uh, from this uh, FDPC. My purpose only to uh, was not to only give the lecture and get rid of all the things. I try to develop some sort of uh, intention in you, in, on you how to carry out some research with minimum facility and how to get some knowledge from that expert. Okay. So I am not uh, getting any other queries. Uh, if want, anybody want to say something, they can say here. Okay. Otherwise, we have to uh, end this lecture here. Is there anybody? You can raise your hand if you have not time to type here. Okay. Uh, we are not getting any queries. I hope uh, they get some idea. Okay, so thank you, sir. Uh, and a participant. Uh, so I want to uh, give the uh, thanks uh, to the our uh, uh, professor Hamant Kosi. So thank you very much to give uh, your time, precious time, to that uh, participant. I hope the, all the participants will be very beneficial. They get some idea, uh, and I think they uh, can carry out some sort of research from the idea they got in, but from you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for invitation. Okay, okay. Now, is, yes. I can, I can them or, uh, sir, uh, later on, I'll talk to you over that MS team uh, and we'll try yes. to discuss if, uh, any other future course and all other things. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank okay. you, sir. Yeah, bye. -bye.